Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Broadway Con panel, Making Theater in the Pandemic. When they told me that this was the subject that we were going to be talking about, uh, making theater in this pandemic, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine anything I'd rather talk about because it's just about the thing I've been most obsessed with for months and months. Um, and we are incredibly lucky to have these people with us. Um, I'm going to say their uh, in introductions very, very briefly, and I admire each one so much. But I will make it brief, but I just want to give you a very brief idea who each person is. Blair Russell is a Tony-nominated producer and developer um, who brought us the Slave Play, the critically acclaimed immersive off-Broadway production of Sweeney Todd, and the 2020 virtual production of the last five years, which I just saw, which is incredible. Uh, currently serves on the board of the um, New York Theatre Barn and the New Harmony Project. Jason Michael Webb is a composer, a lyricist, a, lyricist, a musical director, a producer, and an arranger. Mr. Webb received the 2019 Special Tony Award for his outstanding arrangements for Choir Boy, musical director of The Color Purple and directed by John Doyle, and also involved with and created, I cannot wait to hear about this, the virtual production as well of the last five years. Uh, Christine Toy Johnson is an award-winning actor, writer, director, filmmaker, and an advocate for inclusion in New York City. She's uh, most currently was on the national tour of Come From Away. She's done it all from Broadway to the most incredible and prestigious regional theaters across the country, including the, Guth the Guthrie, Williamstown, the Yale Rep, Minnesota Opera, and so much more. Uh, she also wrote and produced a documentary film, which you may tell us some more about. Anne Harada, Anne Harada originated the role of Christmas Eve and appeared in the Vineyard, the Broadway, the London productions of Avenue Q. Uh, she spent two years as the stepsister, which was an amazing performance, as Charlotte in Cinderella on Broadway. Uh, also been on Broadway, I've seen all of this, nine to five, Les Miserables playing Madame Thenardier, um, Susical, M. Butterfly, and her solo concert, her beautiful solo concert was at the American Songbook series at Lincoln Center um, in 2014. She appeared in the classic stage company revival of Pacific Overtures, and her television roles are, are many, from Smash to The Big C, Lipstick Jungle, 30 Rock, and so much more. Anne Harada is an icon, and I'm so uh, flattered and excited that she joined uh, our conversation. Drew Gelling starred on Broadway in The Jersey Boys and On a Clear Day, and he originated the role of Jim in Waitress. Uh, you may also know him from Anne of Green Gables, from A Minister's Wife, uh, and television roles on Elementary and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, The Good Fight, etc. Also the new musical, Dave. I happen to just have seen him star in a virtual production of Amour just last weekend, and I'm sure he has some interesting things to tell us about that for making theater in the pandemic. So those are our amazing friends. And uh, I am Alyssa Errico, and I am a singer and an actress and a writer. So, all right, so to begin with, is that too much, guys? <laughs> Not at all. That was great. It's great to hear about everybody. Whoa, I know. So I'm going to start with what, um, you know, I have three little children in, uh, in middle school, and uh, sometimes they start the day uh, when they sit around in a circle circle with what they call the rose and thorn question. And, uh, you know, how was your weekend or is, you know, how was your holiday, et cetera. It was something good and something bad. So what was the single most um, successful uh, and productive thing that happened to all of you um, as artists? And you are amazing artists. I hope you're satisfied with your little intros because it's everyone, it's, there's millions more things and always. So what was the most productive? thing and what really was the most uh, frustrating um, I can start in brief and say that the really the the high point for me was to be a part of the Sondheim 90th birthday uh, of, in which uh, Anne Harada beautifully sang uh, someone in a tree um, I was very very proud 
got to take part in that. I sang in my little guest room where I'm sitting right now, uh, sitting on my bed uh, while my children were actually waiting for dinner. And my husband had the COVID virus in the basement. And it was the first couple of weeks of the pandemic. I was very, very touched to be a part of the, the celebration. Uh, and also I learned a lot about the song just by singing children in art while I was under some duress and my husband was sick and the kids needed me to get to stop working and to get um, away from my phone and get on to making them dinner. Um, so children in art and the struggle of that. I also had a book behind me that said Irish erotic art and I didn't realize my bookshelf had an erotic art book. So I became like a viral kind of mysterious woman what's with the sexy book and all this you know it turns out the book was a joke and it was blank but i so it was just a funny and weird night where i was broadcast around the world as a mother with a sex book so that was kind of funny <laughs> and then the hardest thing that happened to me was um i had to transfer files for a green screen musical to the irish repertory theater they were making a christmas musical and i had to transfer transfer my own performance from my room this screen can be on the other side is green i had to transfer the files and i just got overwhelmed by the tech and i had a complete anxiety attack like an actual couldn't breathe and i had to get a paper bag and call my father who's a doctor and like breathe into a bag i was so stressed about the tech how to get my performance just to where i needed to get it I was out of my league and I was like literally had an anxiety attack. Of course I was fine. All you need to do is breathe into a bag. But that's how bad it got for me in terms of uh, frustration. So that is just one example of my, you know, best and worst. But does anyone have a, you know, just jump in if you're ready to say something. But uh, yeah, I mean, as a producer, and I've done quite a few things during the pandemic, I don't know, I, all my children are equally special. So all of it was great, but also like just the response to the, to the last five years has been really, really positive and kind of overwhelming um, and unexpected. And then, you know, doing uh, brand new things, uh, trying new things. I've been doing work in virtual reality with sound, yeah. um, Zoom and all these different things. You know, there's been a couple of times where uh, performance and go is expected or I've had to cancel something and move it to the next day just because the technology doesn't cooperate with you. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know that that's, that's necessarily a low point. You know, we have this in, in when we're doing it in, in real life, right? You have days where things don't go right, but it's been those, those days are hard and you just think, oh, wouldn't it be so much easier if we were just in person and you could just do the show, right? You know, without the tech or without this or without that. But, um, you know, the obviously when the pandemic first started, that was also a low point. But as a producer, I was already unemployed and working from home anyway. So it was just sort of like a, a change in what I was creating. Yeah. Oh, so we're used to frustration, you mean, but it's just a different type. <laughs> just a different yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, none of us are strangers to frustration, that's for sure. I can't wait to hear more about Crux and, and uh, what XR is, et cetera, but I'll get to you. <laughs> yeah, you have incredible stuff. Anyone else with a rose and a thorn? Sure. Um, I, I would say I've been writing a ton this year, and um, a short play of mine called Empress Maley Lotus Blossom found its way to three new theaters that I had never worked with, and they produced online performances and um so with two different casts and uh, we're making a short film of it that's that's going to come out in, in a in a month or so so it's that's that was a really a high point on the expected new uh collaborations um yeah, so the title empress lady empress may lee lotus oh, blossom lady. yeah oh, awesome. it's about <laughs> it's about a teenek born asian american actress who poses as an exotic Hong Kong movie star so she can get her shot on Broadway. Uh, I, I've told us, I've been told it's called, it's cheeky. And Anne has seen it. So she she could tell me if I'm if I'm right or that. <laughs> I think it's cheeky. <laughs> Thank you. I like cheeky. I like cheeky. <clears throat> and you know, on the other side, I I, I agree that the that there's been so many um 
ups and downs. And, you know, I was doing the tour of Comfort Way. And of course, we were so rudely interrupted on March 12th, like so many other people. So you were out of town, like you were in a city and you literally got the call to come home. Yeah. And pack your trunk, you know, take your take maybe things that you would need for, I don't know, six weeks or so. Oh. And uh, yeah. And so then <laughs> fast forward to a couple of months later, all of the stuff got mailed to us uh, as we as we uh, awaited news, um, which, of course, we're still awaiting. But but well, I think it's on the horizon. The right. Like your makeup and everything from backstage. Yeah. Yeah. They sent it all. They sent it all. Everything else is on, in trucks somewhere in Texas um, waiting for for our return, uh, hopefully in October. So your high point is this this play and all the new productions did you say and just being i mean obviously be, being taken off the road was just crushing especially come from away which is such yeah a you know we're 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 fortunate because we we know that the show will come back and we we are very aware of how fortunate we are and and um look forward to bringing that story um back to i'd be interested to hear because come from away meant so many things when it happened like so right. many more things than any like than that so many shows i'd ever seen it was so contemporary in terms of all the stresses of our global world so i'd be so interested to see what it i, I would like to see it again after this trauma yeah really. well yeah. first of all we we're all going to cry through the whole thing oh when you first <laughs> And then once we get through that, yeah, we'll be, it will be, it's always, we've always been able to connect on a very deep level with the audience over, you know, there's this craving to, to embrace uh, intentional generosity and compassion after a lot of things that we've all been through in the last uh, four years or so. Well, you are a very intentional person. I read somewhere that uh, right before the uh, performance of Come From Away, you have a tradition of holding your, your heart and- hey slowing down, which we all, you know, I get hyper, we, you know, you slow yourself down right before the performance and you listen to the audience. I and do. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe you read that somewhere. I must've talked about it. And so you've done your research, Melissa. <laughs> well, I couldn't help myself because once I started, I, I, I had a reason for each person, but they, it's just like a window opens, you know, this is an extraordinary group of people, but yeah. So you hold your heart and listen to the audience and you make yourself present that's I, one of your things is yeah, to be present. yeah. I, I have a little gratitude mantra to to thank the universe for the opportunity to, to tell the story and and hope to fulfill my potential at the moment and be open to receive and open to express and then it just centers me and, and puts me in the moment and ready to ready to go yeah well i'm sure you're going to hold your heart in an extra way <laughs> yeah. yeah in the future and i bet jason you would be this very similar I've, you know, you have a deep uh, way in which you work with your music to heal and to reach people. Um, are you going to be holding your heart? I mean, anyway, let's. I know that's a, that's not the rose and thorn question, but I'm sure you're going to have a prayer too before you set to your piano. You know, for sure. I mean, I think I, I spend a lot of time working in the church, um, and so I have a certain association with healing and uh, you know how effective music can be. Um, and so I, um, you know, I, I think I spend my whole life holding my heart. Yeah, I think you um, do. And, uh, and really staying conscious of, you know, there's a reason why we've been given the gifts that we've been given and what we're doing with them, we want to stay conscious of. So, um, yeah, I, I, life is full of heart holding and, and hoping that, well, I will say my belief is that it's, it's a lot about making sure that we're doing what we can to take care of our people and to put awesome stuff into the universe to help someone else and you know all that good stuff um which actually brings me to one of the my highlight of the pandemic which you know it's still fresh and blair talked about it already but i'll say it again directed in the last five years um this year has been just so rewarding from not only the response because the response is an awesome you know it was an unexpected uh you know success that we're having with it yeah. um but with, uh, but I, noticed I, that, I noticed that by, by popular demand it's streaming again um is it right now or it's starting in a week 13th. i think it comes back next week yeah tuesday tuesday the 13th of april for the rest of the month yes until right? the 25th that, yeah that's so wonderful i did i did watch it and i knocked out um so the highlight for you would be the last five years would it be an additional highlight? Correct me if I'm wrong, but 
you directed it as well as did that incredible work with the uh, orchestra and the musical direction. Yeah, I mean, it, it was an inc it was the team was unmatched. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah I did the color purple years ago, and I thought that was just going to be the most beautiful. You know, coming out of that was just such a glorious, beautiful experience. I used to always tell people that's my most amazing theatrical. You know, it was so full of love and so full of family. And then the last five years came, and it was just as full, if not more, full of love and emotion. And the story is so emotionally rich anyway. Um, to really uh, be in a place where everyone felt safe and uh, everyone felt safe and generous with their contribution. It, you know, we ended up with something really, really awesome. So that was clearly the highlight of the pandemic, creating the pandemic for me. Did you enjoy being the visual director? I enjoyed, I enjoyed directing it and having the support of um, Adam Honoré and, and uh, Brian Bond, uh, to help bring it to life. I mean, the whole, there's no one on the team that I couldn't just talk and talk and talk about. Uh, am I wrong, but I'm just, I'm not, I don't know anything about the show, but having seen it or watched it, were you all in one? Yes. Time? Yes. Um, the, the concept for this one was that these characters are kind of reliving. It's like when you're in the, when you're in the shower and you're going over some argument that you had earlier and you're like, you know, you're reliving it, reimagining it and, and, and kind of seeing it in, from your perspective, that's what these characters are doing. And so they all kind of manifest, they all manifest in this apartment that they share space in and not necessarily always time in. Right, they're retrospecting their lives, but in different directions. For sure. Um, the, uh, the wedding scene, was that tricky? Tricky, the whole thing was tricky, but um, that's I'm the awesome thing the about thing, these. But was that was that a thorn in any way? I mean, such an, a visual accomplishment to try to create that moment. Uh, I, th I think it was. Um, it, everything in the show was a challenge. That was that just came out so beautifully. Like a lot of the moments in the show, but that I don't know. There's a moment if, if anybody watches it. This is a moment that I I kind of enjoy every single time it happens. When they're rotating um, during the wedding, I think after they've kissed, they dance a little bit. As they're dancing like a tear comes out of Neja's eye just as the camera's moving around, which is, you know, I'd love to say that mm -hmm. I directed that. Um, God, I love a happy accident. It, it, That's it's one of the, oh amazing. man, it's, it's so glorious. It's almost like a confirmation. Every time one of those things happens, it's a confirmation that, you know, we're doing what yeah. we're supposed to be doing. So such an encouragement. And as far as a thorn, I mean, the, the big thorn is I'm sure we all have in common where the day we realized this is going to last longer than we thought it was going to last. That was like the thorn day. I was like, oh, dag, I thought I was going to get to see my, you know, the people that I love sooner. But uh, what it did was it caused us all to figure out new ways to engage and new ways to create. And so we end up with these beautiful new things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not done with you with the last five years because there's a, I have a couple of very specific uh, how you did it type questions. Um, so are we sort of, thorn free in general with you, you think? Was there a, there was never really a sit down and like, ah, uh, moment. You know, uh, you know, people, you, you seem to have found a new reservoir I try to energy. look for the good, you know, look for the silver lining if you want to look at it that way. It's like, I look for, it's a challenge, but there's a solution in here somewhere and it's going to be awesome when we find it. So come on y'all, let's be excited about finding it. That's my attitude. Oh, you should have come over the day I couldn't, I literally had to breathe into a bag. I could not, maybe it's because I'm, you know, my, I'm old, but I just, the, I didn't understand how all of this was supposed to get all the way over there because we transfer doesn't take this much stuff. And trust me, I did know like a lot. I just didn't know enough. I couldn't do it. I, I fell over, but I figured it out. Um, so, well, you're a beautiful soul, but I do have a thousand more questions about some of the things that you did with the orchestra, et cetera, come back. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Or Drew, any roses? I feel like they just, you? one leads to the next, you know, um, my biggest bugaboo during this entire time has been the self-tape issue. Um, huh. I, came, I came into it with very little uh, tech knowledge. And so every single audition was a drama for me. And luckily, usually I would have like my husband around to help me at least like put the camera in the right place or something. 
but uh, um, as it takes, I got a TV job in Vancouver, which was the greatest thing that happened to me because it was a big job that lasted for a long time and it provided me with health insurance. Wow. Um, my the thorn right, that happened right before that was that I had been cut out of another TV job because they said, oh, because of COVID, we're just going to change the plot. And so bye-bye. And I was so upset because then I wasn't going to get my health insurance. And so all of these things will get health insurance. I just have to keep turning in self tapes in the hopes that somebody will hire me and I can get health insurance. So because I was so, I was very sad about that one thing, but then this other thing came along and it just, it's just by the amount of content we're generating that I've been putting out there, like, please God, somebody hire me. Okay. Can we look for you? Then, Can we look for for you on the show that that did work out? Or yes, yes, Schmigadoon. Schmigadoon next summer on Apple TV. Oh, Schmigadoon. I wanted to ask you about Schmigadoon. Okay, terrific. Great, great, Schmigadoon. great. Okay, so. Oh, I can't wait to hear about that. Okay, so put that aside. So then as a result of being in Vancouver by myself, I had, I had to struggle because I'm true Gailey knows all about this. I worked on something called The Nice List, which required everybody to sing like you in your closet, into your you know, little microphone, and then like, here's my file. Now I have to send it somewhere, you know, and the Wi Fi, and you're in your hotel room, and you're like, I don't know if this is going to work. I literally was in my bathtub because that was the best place in Vancouver to send a file. Like, okay, here we go. Like, if stuff like that. And I just had such a huge learning curve, and I was by myself. So I didn't have anybody to help me, like, put it on a box, you know, like, I know, <laughs> trying try to figure out angles and stuff i mean it was a nightmare and i just thought i cannot do this i will not be able to do this by myself like it's impossible and i had like Tally leon on the phone with me like literally oh, you did talking That's me crazy. through my iphone you know like and press this button now you're gonna go to the you know <laughs> i like I, I was it was so I, bad I, like it was so yeah exactly point point, point. Point of order. I I I, I saw a lot of this raw footage, and you were pretty amazing. Because I was in my apartment filming my girlfriend, who was in the same show. Right. <laughs> yeah. she, she was in the show. Her footage looked amazing. She wasn't the director after every take like I was. But that's because you're best friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the director is my best friend. So he's literally like, why, why is your eyeline so terrible? Why can't you do this? And I was just like, I hate you and I'm by myself. And, you know, and he's like on my, he's like on my iPad yelling at me from an angle going like, okay, <laughs> just try to look directly. It was just like that all the time. Why is your hair so messy? Why can't you? It's like, guys, I'm, oh, I'm one person here. I can't memorize the script and my hair look good it's not gonna happen sorry you know One and of, i was working yeah yeah it, it was like a lot of that it was like a lot of that kind of frustration where you're like this shit is getting in my way if you want me to do the work it has to be a little easier than this <laughs> that's basically my whole thing so that's where that's like my whole pandemic every everything I've tried to make and every, you know, and I've done like a million podcasts and meetings and blah, 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 but everything has had a component of why is this so hard? Yeah. You know what I totally. mean? And do they make a big tripod for an iPad? You know, like that kind of question. Which they do. <laughs> Which they Yeah, do. apparently so. But like, you know, I didn't know. About a year ago, I wrote right before the pandemic, I wrote a large story. I have a series of the New York Times that I write called Scenes from an Acting Life. And I pitched a story about self-taping. And the actual uh, you know, head of the arts section said, is this pertinent? I said, pertinent? like, this is our lives. During the pandemic, I got an email. Well, look at you. Weren't you ahead of the curve? I was thinking, <laughs> awesome. It was really fun to write. By the way, the, one of my key interviews was Telly because he's so good at tech. He, he was one of my uh, examples of the millennials who just take it out from under the bed in five minutes, set it up and off they go. Um, and uh, 
one of the very interesting young men that I met was in LA was the person who invented the word self tape. Oh, wow. And he actually has a copyright on the word. He, he is Mr. Self tape. He's actually the godfather of the word. And he, I interviewed him. He has a website called self tape.com. He lives in uh, Hollywood. I'm going to bring this up with you, uh, Blair, because he has been working on augmented reality so that we can audition in three dimensions and actually enter the room for, of producers and directors. And actually, we can walk into people's rooms in 3D, apparently. This is his big goal. And my point in the article was that if the big goal is for us to walk in the room, maybe we should just walk in the room at some point. Now, that was the ironic undertow of what I was trying to write, but there is this world of augmented reality even ahead of us, oh, and so we must brace wait. ourselves. <laughs> yes, we must brace ourselves. Um, what a great answer. So, Drew, tell us a little no, I mean, about it's, your it's ups really and downs. Funny that uh, Anne said that. Having you know, being uh, uh, primarily an actor as as well as a creator during this time, it's been really weird because I've spent a ton of time learning to wear a bunch of different hats where you suddenly are not only in charge of just reading and nailing a scene, but you're also your own uh, PA, you're your own producer, you're your own sound mixer. You're uh, like, I'm gonna show you guys where all of like the voiceover work that I've done for the past year has happened <laughs> like right yeah. out of this closet <laughs> full of clothes. Yeah, where my where my microphone sits, and so the weird thing was is before the pandemic, I spent so much time going, you know what? If I could instead of going into this audition room for this film, if I could just be at home and nail the takes on my own, I feel like like I would really be able to do a better job of kind of directing myself. And so, you know, be careful what you wish for because then the thorn of that ended up being that the real truth of that from an actor's perspective is when I am directing myself and producing myself and picking my own best takes, I'm not always picking the best take. Mm -hmm. I'm picking the take that is the least complicated for the things that I look for in myself mm. that I do or don't like which may or may not be the most interesting thing from, from a director's perspective or a producer's perspective. So learning to kind of, you know, kind of self-direct and self-produce yourself, but not, but, but still be able to kind of sit down and drop in in the moment has been kind of a, a bit of a task, especially in all of the different kinds of projects that we've been able to work uh, on throughout the year. But like at the same time, there were special sauce able to kind of be in the same space with people like for the last five years when you have everybody in that one apartment even if it's fewer people than before you still get that special sauce of 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 somebody kind of being able to react off of someone else and and in turn the most rewarding experiences I've had have been taping um my lovely partner Julia um for for projects that she's worked on like the nice list or uh when I did a, um, a version of Assassins that was all in a friend's apartment and we all were in it together and had gone through testing protocols in order to film it and and, you and make- get, You did get together in that case, physically. Yeah, they, we I did. Heard, they were so clearly alive together. Yeah. Because people are so excited and itching for that. And so I, and myself included. So, you know, the being able to, be together in whatever form we can has been the has been the things that I look forward to so going true. forward. That's so true. Yeah. I mean, I did a green screen musical though, and we weren't together at all. And that's another piece I wrote in the Times, which was this weird idea of doing Meet Me in St. Louis with a 14 person cast and an orchestra. But we were all on Zoom rehearsing and then on Zoom performing like it's hard to explain this. And then there was another setup with our iPhones. So we saw each other on Zoom, but we were recording on the iPhone. The orchestra was in our ears. So we were kind of performing together, but if you could see over the other stuff, you could sort of see the cast, everyone in these green sort of squares all over the world. I'm well, not the world, all over the United States. 
So yeah. we weren't together. So it it's the the you know Meet Me in St. Louis is all about the World's Fair in the um, in the early twentieth. Um, the World's Fair is when the Mr. Ferris invented the Ferris wheel. And it's the first Ferris wheel in the United States. And the idea of the Ferris wheel was an image I couldn't let go of. And I, when I wrote my essay in the Times, I said that I felt like we were uh, uh, somewhat like a Ferris wheel, uh, all in our isolated pods, you know, but sort of subject to the same motion, together but apart. And the separateness was quite agonizing, to be honest. I, I was extremely ambivalent about making that kind of theater. I didn't say that, but I was sort of tortured. I, I, I was super ambivalent about a green screen musical. You're describing getting rid of lots and lots of people having smaller groups, valuing those, but really making, getting those connections. I think that was like the third or fourth chapter of the pandemic. There was a time we couldn't even do what Jason and Blair so beautifully accomplished. Did you ever do any work? Was your green screen musical that I just saw, were you separate in different, were you oh, in your own home? No, I, yeah, for, for Amour, we were entirely on our own, <clears throat> which was really difficult. As you can imagine, you did the show. I did, um, I did the show. Uh, I did my own green screen musical, like I said, of me, which was just bizarre because yeah. I don't even know the, I didn't even know the height of all my children. I'm the mother of like five kids. <laughs> I was had to just look downish, yeah. Hoping that I would look. And there were days they didn't know where the, to look. They said, "Just do it once, looking here, and once looking here." Mm. So I, I, had, I was I, very lucky to have a seven-year-old daughter um, completely dress up in a green suit, one of those like green screen full body things <laughs> to hand me props because you know I'm supposed to be reaching through walls to to. Yeah. to you get did things. that? Yeah. So um, I had Annie oh like. God. Just kind of standing off to the side in her little green suit, <laughs> handing me stuff. Yeah, you know. That's crazy. You did the whole show in your house in the same room we're looking at now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh Set up the green God. screen and and then would take it down every day because it's a New York City apartment and there ain't a lot of room. So we, you know, that's you. You do what you can. I know a famous journalist for the BBC who sits. He lives on uh, Madison and 88th. And he sits in closet and does some of these most prestigious broadcasts imaginable from the floor in his coat closet. This is like a famous person, I can't say, literally is on the floor in his coat closet on Madison Avenue <laughs> trying to get this broadcast to the BBC in London in time for the morning uh, airing. It's just yeah. bizarre the things we're doing. So you did a moor, uh, you did a moor in your house and it seemed obviously it seemed like you were somewhat together with these other actors but you were all by yourselves yeah every, everybody ended up being by themselves the music team was headed up by uh this uh excellent music producer named mark governor who uh um is a film composer and uh, music uh, uh editor on and producer on his own so uh all of us recorded our audio live and recorded the video simultaneously and the hardest part is that you know you kind of send off that footage and um in the same way that uh ann did with um nice list that it just kind of goes to it goes off into the ether and then they kind of took us and placed us in space uh, and essentially put us all together into um, the the story that that ended up uh, being um, aired. And your vocals were live. The vocals were done live with the takes that we that we did. Yeah. And that brings me then. I want to go through a little bit about how you did those beautiful vocals of the last five years. Before we do that, Jason, I want to ask you a question. We'll come back to how and the how we have been making this theater in the pandemic. I'm just interested. I come right to you first because I see the discipline of playing the piano and uh, and some of the concerts that you've done and so on. And then I know uh, Christine will jump in because she has such good working habits and so on with her writing. Has your prof team changed a lot in the pandemic? Like some people have dealt with, uh, you know, feeling a little like their daily life, their routines uh, get a little kind of hopeless. 
or has there has there been a kind of backward blessing here, a sense of restarting? Like, how have you changed your professional routines? Um, well, like, yeah, I think that there's been. I feel like I've been through all the seasons where when it first started, it was like, oh, dag, we're not going to be able to be in a room. Let me take a little time to relax. No, now I need to be productive in order to feel good about myself. Like it went all the way around all those emotions um, and landed in a routine that consists of like being creative when it comes, which is kind of how I operate anyway. Um, so being creative when those things present themselves and also uh, being available to other people people who want to create things and, and help. Cause not everything that we've done through, throughout the pandemic gets publicized. It's like we help each other in other ways. And so getting a chance to be available for, for other people to, to help me be creative has also been, uh, been a blessing. So in that way, it's changed a little bit. It's like, it's forced, I think all of us to find new ways to reconnect and make sure that we're being uh, creative and productive. You're reminding me that there that there uh, has been more time for me even today, but oh, to appreciate uh, and pay attention to the creative work of so many other artists uh, that I might not have had time to see their show. Or, you know, is there has there been a person or a creative artist that really impressed you during the this pandemic year? That is there sort of a best thing you saw or a one cool thing you saw? This is going to be the most self uh, serving answer that you're probably going to get today. But it's actually not really self-serving because I just want to celebrate the people that worked on the last five years. Nick and Nasia, the, uh, the entire team, wow. I was just so impressed with um, and gave me such an inspiration and helped me look back at, you know, what I've been doing previously and what I'm going to be doing moving forward. Um, it's kind of set the bar super high. It's a huge achievement, period. Thank you. End of story. It is. It's well, a major accomplishment. There's just, it's fascinating. And it's really about like letting people work and get out of the way. Um, you know, it's been really important to me during this time because when you're talking about these uh, productions where you were just sort of separate and putting together footage and sending it in, I've kind of tried to avoid that for the most part. And everything that I've done from, you know, the second week of the shutdown, I called everyone I knew who had a one person show or like they performed a show with their partner. And I was like, okay, you're going to do a live stream. And then that was the second week of the, of, of the pandemic. And I was like, okay, Hey, what's next? And starting, you know, I started uh, working with Crux in the virtual reality and augmented reality space, which was really about bringing people together in a new way. Um, it's not meant to replace, you know, live performance, but it's it's like I always describe it, uh, especially in virtual reality, as almost like um, puppeteering. It's a, just a different type of performance. But people are live, people are there. People's internet drops out and they disappear, and we got to respond to that. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I started another company, Resounding, where we were doing live audio performances. And everyone's at home and we're all together on Zoom, but really the, the performance is just with the voice. And so we still had that feeling of like, oh, we're going live. We're about, the show's about to start. Okay, let's see what happens. And again, you know, maybe somebody's <laughs> internet drops out, but we were able to kind of perform through that and keep going. And we were and doing that- an audio thing? That's it. So it's all in binaural audio, which is like a 360 audio performance. So people are just sitting at home with their microphone and they're delivering their voice and we're mixing in sound effects and music and it's moving all around, you know, people's wow. heads. And so now we're going to be doing it. Um, it we're going to be performing uh, out in Queens. We're going to be doing the performance live and socially distanced. And we're going to have a live audience who's going to have headphones to listen. And then also a remote audience. Headphones. You need special headphones, right? You don't even need special headphones. You, any pair of headphones will do it, actually. And, and so we're going to have a remote audience and a live audience. And that starts uh, April 23rd. But just so doing cool. these things where it had that sense of liveness. And even after the shows were all like giddy and still you have to just turn off your computer and go to bed. It's not quite <laughs> the same. But just having that moment where you feel like, oh, we're together again, right? Like we did yeah. it. We did a performance that was that was really powerful so that's been you know last five years it was the same thing it was like okay if, if it was going to be something zoom it wouldn't have really felt the same but knowing that they were all going to be together and being able to capture that live nature that was so powerful and i cannot claim anything about that you know i was just i literally didn't even see the show until the premiere and i just said like this is a great people group of people get it together and i'm very hands-off like that oh, as a producer you didn't see the magic <laughs> 
was, was we appreciate literally, it, by the way we appreciate I, it I, I, I mean i let's let's be honest like um jason you know jason was already on as music director and we were looking for a director and he approached and was like i want to do this and i'm the kind of person who when i feel like somebody has passion for something like i want to see what they they create and liz at out of the box has like oh my god she's an amazing person who somehow does everything and just like got all these people together, made sure that everyone was safe. And then they produced this thing that still gives me, I don't know if it's my COVID vaccine or what, but I still get chills just thinking about it. So congratulations <laughs> on your vaccine. That was just today, that right? That was just today, yes. So I'm so happy for you. You know, the thing is, I want to back up a little bit with you. I was sort of saving this because it's this frontier that I, I think maybe Anne will agree with me is a little intimidating. Extended reality, that's what XR means. Yeah, yeah. So anything within virtual reality or augmented reality, right? So this is something new to me. This is you are you are doing this creatively, but I would imagine also it's liberating because we are no longer now really I'm going to need your help here everyone. We are learning in the pandemic that Manhattan, that New York, New York, that Times Square is not uh, it's not that it's lost its luster, but it's it's not it's not likely that theater will be only concentrated now in that twenty block radius or ten block that we are so used to. You're having ideas to kind of bring entertainment, storytelling, black storytelling, all kinds of storytelling to new realms. To so it's not uh, exclusionary, so that it's not limited to you know your. Uh, uh, you know, your set audience at Manhattan Theater right. Club or at some place, some institution where we have to please our this and that donors or these are the, the 600 people who pay every year for tickets. And so, so they are going to want X amount of product. And so we can have to put a musical end of this. In other words, we felt, I guess, now that we're reassessing, very trapped by a lot of the things that have defined the theater world. Not just that, but you, also the concept of what makes a well-made play, right? Right. I've heard you talk about that. The well-made play. So, we're tell me a little more about Crux and the idea of sort of not democratizing theater. And this is not a political panel and so on, but like, <laughs> but kind of an artistically political thing. Like, how are you? Yeah. You're so full of joy and so full of curiosity to share stories. Seems like you want to do it in different ways, different platforms. Well, very, fun? very quickly, it's that. Um, theater and movies, film, television, those are industries that were started and have been run by a single group for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And uh, virtual reality, augmented reality is brand new. No one owns it yet. No one is a leader yet. And Crux, our mission is really to, um, to identify and tell people that this doesn't have to be about the, old, the same old stories being told. We can, the, the basis of storytelling in virtual reality can be black storytelling, can be from the, um, the perspectives of other people of color. And so let's establish this group of people who our mission is to advance the storytelling. And by doing that, there'll never be that opportunity to have the excuse of, well, I don't know where to find somebody or I don't know how to do it. And so literally this year, I've been doing different projects and just pulling um, actors and directors and writers from the theater community and saying, let's do this together, let's explore this. And so now when somebody goes and they're looking for the next person to do some live performance in virtual reality, they'll, there will be a black director and three, five black writers and 10 black actors who have all done it before. Mm -hmm. And they'll be able to be the leaders uh, in, in this new industry. And I see it as an, another way of performing, not a replacement, but just like, yeah. you know, performers do theater and television and film and voiceover, virtual <laughs> reality will be another. Wow. Wow. So at the bottom of our thing, we have roller skating, we have all our different special skills. <laughs> now we know how to do virtual reality performing. Uh, is, it, is it the kind of thing though, for the audience to watch it? Obviously they, you're now exploring the idea of a global audience. Uh, I've been approached during the pandemic by some people who never would normally have called me, but who used to do festivals that you know were like world music festivals and they're like melissa what you do is so niche like doing cabaret and singing french songs and song time and so on. but the truth is people are desperate for it in australia mm -hmm. they're all over the place my spotify numbers have exploded in weird corners of the world like yeah. 
parts of Australia. I'm never going to Australia with three little kids, you know, but now I, I can, if I knew how to do this, I might be able to create like a nightclub. You absolutely can. It exists. There's a whole group. So what we found, so we, we created these live performances in virtual reality and I never used the word theater. We just invited people. We said, we're doing this and people who would not normally have any kind of interest in theater showed up whole groups of um, there's and we used a particular their social platform and there's a community of, of, of black people in this platform who get together and they have parties and they do celebrations and they all came to our performance because we we titled it the black imagination series and they just showed up because of that and these are not people who who would be able to go to broadway they were from the uk and they were from australia and they were from uh, many other countries and so you find that by making it more accessible the audience just grows and you, you find people who um have never experienced these things before but really really enjoy it you know, Blair, I don't mean to hijack the idea, but I'm a mother of a certain age and I've been around since I did Les Mis when I was 18 with Anne did so beautifully, Madame Thenardier, I was Cosette. I've been around forever. As I get older, it's harder to, to know, you know, who's going to cast me, what the jobs will be. But you, in a weird way, seem to give uh, me hope or the idea that there's lots of different ways to keep creating, to, to handle the idea idea of the gatekeeper, but for yeah. yourself, not, I'm thrilled for black uh, storytelling and, and uh, inclusion and so on, but also a lot of artists who have trouble finding a platform or are not finding a platform. There's so many ways to, to possibly perform if and, you see what I'm saying. And doing uh, performances in this new ways also allows that. So with Resounding, we're able to cast people and, you know, that they may not be cast on Broadway in this role because it's not traditional, but we're able to cast people with this and roles that they wouldn't be able to do in the traditional play. Uh, we're able to cast people of color. We're able to cast people someone who's blind. Uh, trans, non-binary, someone who's blind, uh, people of any age. Like it's really everything I want to do, I want to uh, make it open and I want to invite people into it uh, and the audience as well invite the audiences so that it really is global and it's not yeah. you know do you have the money are is it uh, you know are you um uh, able to be on stage and do the traditional kind of roles so i i really want to open it up and and allow people like jason opportunities to do things that you know i can't say that nobody would um have said like hey jason direct the, the broadway production of the last five years but it was an opportunity for us to say like, let's try new things and let's invite new people into the space and then create magic. And I really hope people see that and hire Jason to do a oh, ton they of will. other <laughs> they will. Direct, directly. Me too. So somebody call me. <laughs> no, they will. Jason, you're you for sure they will. Oh, that's so good. All right, you're not gonna believe this, but we're already out of time. But I wanna go through each person really quickly uh, because there's so much more to hear about you. So, so much more to say. Uh, starting with Christine, tell us uh, how we can find you and learn yeah. more. Uh, oh, you can find me in way too many ways. Uh, my website, christinetoyjohnson.com, Twitter and Instagram at ctoyj. And thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Uh, Drew? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at, at Drew Galing or on Twitter as well. And um, I thank so much for having me here. It's been an honor to talk to and hear from all of you guys. Yeah. Uh, Jason? Uh, I'm on Instagram at Jason Michael Webb, uh, website jasonmichaelwebb.com. And this has been so much fun. Looking forward to the next one. Anne, how can we find you? Uh, Twitter at, uh, at Anne Harada and uh, Instagram at I am Anne Harada, but I never check it because I'm so old. So um, yeah, don't even. Um, don't even try. I'll find you. Um, yeah, you'll find me. I'm around. All right, and, and Blair, we how, how, all the different ways we can find you. I'm sure there's a few. I personally don't post anything interesting, so you don't care about my uh, <laughs> social media, but you can follow, uh, if you're interested in, in virtual reality and black storytelling, that's at Crux XR. And if you're interested in live narrative storytelling in binaural audio, that's at resounding.live. Wow. Wow. And I'm Melissa Erico. You can reach me at melissaerico.com and Melissa underscore Erico on uh, Twitter. So thank you so much. And uh, we will be back. And um, uh, the theater's beating heart, uh, if you ask me, uh, lies in these amazing panelists. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you on stage and in all these other realities. Bye.